And then uh, let me try to introduce Professor Chan. Um, I'm so glad to, um, to introduce uh, Professor Chan here. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Computational and Applied Math Mathematics at Rice University. After receiving his PhD from University of Texas at Austin in 2013, he served as postdoc at Rice University from 2013 to 2015, and at Virginia Tech uh, from 2015 and 2016, before returning to Rice as faculty in 2016. His research focused on accurate and uh, efficient numerical solutions of time-dependent partial differential equations, which is um, very much of our interest. And his recent work has focused on the construction and efficient implementation of provable, stable, high-order methods of wave propagation and fluid flows. Okay, today, uh, Professor Chen is going to Talk about entropy stable schemes for nonlinear conservation loads, uh, higher order discontinuous Galopin methods, and reduced total model. So, no further ado, uh, here you go. Professor Chen, you can start. Thank you very much, Hans. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for, uh, very much for the, uh, for the invitation to speak. It's great to see many of uh, familiar faces and uh, names show up in the, in the Zoom chat window. Uh, so, I will broadly be talking about two different things in this talk. So, it will be largely split into two where I try to introduce what an entropy stable scheme is and then try and show how I can apply this to high order DG methods and also to reduced order modeling in kind of the same framework. Um, so, I should mention before I start that this is, of course, not work that I've done alone. Uh, I've been very lucky to work a little bit with my postdoctoral advisor, Tim Warburton. Uh, on some of the results here. And I have a wonderful team, my postdoc Mario and uh, uh, student Philip Wu. They, uh, they have worked on some results that I'll mention, but most of the uh, results that I'll talk about have been done by these two graduate students, Yimin Lin and Christina Taylor, who I, whose con contributions I really appreciate. Okay, so let me try and set the stage for what I am interested in broadly. I do computational science, I do simulations, and most uh, most of the recent work I've done is focused on aerodynamic applications. So exterior aerodynamics, where you want to resolve acoustic waves, vortices, turbulent behavior, or shocks. And what I generally want is to be able to achieve high accurate levels of accuracy on very uh, complex-ish geometries. So I might be interested in looking at unstructured meshes in order to resolve something like this trifoil over here. Uh, because of this, and because all of my mentors have generally worked in this direction, I have been using discontinuous Kalerkin methods, which give you geometric flexibility in high order for relatively, uh, relatively easily. I've been using this as my primary numerical simulation technique. And I'd like to describe a few reasons why they're nice, why they're not so nice, and how this recent work on entropy stability, I think, addresses some of these underlying issues. So, what am I actually interested in these simulations? I like the fact that uh, these distance scalarian methods can be made high order in a fairly easy way. Um, just to illustrate the effect of uh, order of accuracy, if I take a first order method, say an upwind finite volume method for the advection equation, and just try and simulate a Gaussian kind of going round and round in a periodic domain, then eventually after a few revolutions, you get this behavior here where everything diffuses out. If I increase the second order, then you see much better behavior. There's, uh, you still see some new, some diffusion of uh, solution features, but everything is much better resolved by just going up one order. If I were to go up two more, then you can see this dissipation further decreases. And if I go up to eighth order, then you can see that there's virtually no difference at all between the ejected solution and uh, the exact solution. Uh, and in each of these cases, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm decreasing the number of degrees of freedom. I'm increasing the order, but decreasing the mesh resolution as I go on from first to second to fourth to eighth, so that I have the same number of degrees of freedom everywhere. So this is a purely academic example. It's uh, something you would show in a class, but it's not too hard to extrapolate this to some more realistic applications. Uh, these are not my results, they're results from uh, Andrea Beck and Gregor Gaster and uh, Perilof Pearson, but I think they illustrate the power that high order has for, exter for CFD type problems. So on this top row, you have the Taylor Green vortex at uh, 
several resolutions. So again, they are keeping the same number of degrees of freedom for each uh, each method, but here they have second order, and the second picture is fourth order, and this last picture is at a whopping sixteenth order. And in each case, you can see that as they bump the order up, the res uh, the vortices that you see are resolved more uh, uh, to with higher accuracy. Same for this uh, this driven Kelman Helmholtz instability. You can see that these features in the interface, these fine particular features, those would be fairly hard to resolve using a low order method. And uh, Pearl of Person uses an eighth order scheme in order to get good resolution. In terms of discontinuous scalarity methods versus finite uh, volumes or finite elements, I mainly use discontinuous scalarity because uh, I find them very easy for explicit time stepping. If uh, I want to simulate, uh, if I want to simulate a system of equations using explicit time stepping, then for finite element type methods, I have to invert the mass matrix at every single step. Well, for high order finite elements, this mass matrix is globally coupled but sparse. Uh, for a high order DG method, this mass matrix is block diagonal, trivially invertible. It makes the implementation a little bit easier. Okay, so that's the usual boilerplate that you might hear for a uh, discontinuous scalarity method. But I also want to tell you why I haven't been using high order DG methods for a lot of my uh, uh, simulations in CFD up until recently. So if I run Berger's uh, equation, uh, then with a certain initial condition, this initial condition will develop a shock and for the exact solution, this gives you a discontinuity. But if I run this using a higher order DG method, I see oscillations. If I continue to run this, then these oscillations grow, and eventually they blow up and your simulation crashes. And this is what really plagued me for the uh, first couple of years I tried to use higher order DG methods for CFD, that they are highly non-robust by themselves. If you don't apply additional stabilization or artificial viscosity, then they generally blow up whenever they encounter under-resolved solutions. And Things like shocks and turbulence, which are prevalent everywhere in CFD, are highly under-resolved solutions most of the time. So this motivated me to try and look for uh, something different. And I feel like I found this a couple uh, years back when I learned about entropy-stable high-order schemes. Um, I wanted to avoid uh, I want to avoid the common metrics used for high-order schemes, which was to apply some sort of solution regularization to avoid blow-up and to improve robustness. So in practice, this amounts to adding some artificial viscosity, filtering the solution, or applying slope limiting techniques from finite volumes. And while these all generally work fairly well, they can tend to reduce the amount of uh, the accuracy that you uh, that you achieve. And if you want to gain that accuracy back by reducing the amount of solution regularization, then you might lose robustness again. And so, in my mind, it ends up being a sort of tightrope walking uh, scheme where uh, you have robustness on one hand, higher accuracy on the other. And you're basically trying to tune your stabilization parameters to make sure that you can achieve as much of both as possible. But this is a problem-dependent task, discretization-dependent task. It ends up becoming a little bit of a chore. So what I believe entropy stable schemes offer is a little bit of a little bit more stability, independent of any solution regularization. So if I don't apply anything, then I can run an entropy stable scheme and get some reasonable results for a uh, for a large class of problems. Case in point. Again, these are not my results. Uh, these are results from Chi Wang Shu, uh, Gregor Gassner's group, and a group at, uh, at KAUST. Uh, but all of these are entropy stable simulations for the compressible Euler equations, for the magneto hydrodynamics equations, and for the compressible Navier Stokes equations, where you can see clear examples of turbulence, shocks, uh, vortical structures, under resolved solution features. All of these were run using higher order disk entropy stable schemes without any artificial viscosity filtering or slope limiting. So, my goal has been to uh, basically take these schemes and to expand them to see how general we can get with them. Okay, so I want to first finally explain how these methods work by looking at entropy conservative and entropy stable finite volume methods and then generalizing from the, uh, the structure that arises there. So, I'm sure I don't need to say much about this, but if you're not familiar with finite volumes, I'm basically given a grid. I'm trying to approximate the solution average over each uh, cell. And I basically try to solve the integrated form of the conservation law. So just uh, integrate by parts or uh, use the fundamental theorem of calculus. And you can rewrite uh, your conservation law as so. So if I have the flux at the boundaries, well, I know that there's uh, the solution is dual valued at the boundary. So I need to find some way to pick a unique flux. And what we do is just replace this value of the flux at each bound cell boundary 
with a numerical flux. So depending on the numerical flux, obviously you can uh, you can end up with a whole bunch of different types of schemes. And the specific numerical flux that I'm going to look at are what are called entropy conservative numerical fluxes. And what they aim to do is to try and reproduce a little bit of this entropy stability theory for nonlinear problems and reproduce it at the discrete level. So I think of entropy stability, if, you, if you're not familiar, I think of it essentially as a generalization of an energy balance for a nonlinear conservation law. So if I have burgers, shallow water equations, compressible Euler or Navier-Stokes equations, MHD, there are a class of nonlinear conservation laws which all admit an entropy inequality. So essentially what we do is if we have some convex uh, entropy function, which we can think of as a generalization of entropy, uh, sorry, of energy, then we can define the entropy variables V as the derivative of this uh, convex entropy with respect to the conservative variables. If I then multiply the equations by uh, this set of entropy variables, integrate over the domain, then I can do some manipulations and eventually get that the average rate of change of the entropy plus what essentially amounts to the entropy flux in and out of the boundary is going to be less than or equal to zero. So if you have a closed domain or appropriate boundary conditions, this term vanishes, and you get that the average rate of change of entropy is always decreasing, or always negative, so average entropy is decreasing in time. This is as close as you can get to an energy type uh, for nonlinear problems, uh, and what entropy conservative uh, finite volume methods do is they try to reproduce uh, this at the discrete level in a very specific way. So given our finite volume scheme, I will take this uh, flux to be entropy conservative where it has to be consistent for accuracy, has to be symmetric for conservation, and then it also has to include this very strange conservation condition where if I, I take the difference between two entropy, uh, the entropy variables at two different solution states and oops, contract that against this entropy conservative flux, then the result gives me the difference in what are called the entropy potentials. So if I have this, then I can show that my numerical scheme conserves entropy uh, in that the rate of change of entropy is equal to zero. So this isn't exactly the entropy inequality we saw before, but it's not too difficult to simply, oops, to simply add some dissipation. And if this dissipation is, uh, is constructed appropriately, then we can reconstruct an entropy inequality at this discrete level, at the our finite, our finite volume scheme. Okay. So, the, uh, sorry, I'm having some trouble moving these slides around. Great. So, these uh, entropy conservative fluxes are a little bit more complex. Uh, here's an example for the compressible Euler equations in 1D. You have something like the average of the density multiplied by the average of the velocity, but this average of the density is taken to be the strange logarithmic average. You also have some additional strange quantities. You have the inverse temperature beta. You have a uh, logarithmic average of that as well. Um, but these are entropy conservative fluxes in explicit form. And these are going to be the main ones that I use throughout this, uh, this uh, for all the numerical experiments in this talk. Okay, so entropy conservative and entropy stable finite volumes are, they date back to the 1980s and I think even before a little bit. What, uh, I real, what was interesting recently was that uh, there were a couple of folks, Gassner, Carpenter, uh, Chi Wang Shu, and some others who showed that you can reformulate these uh, methods using Hadamard products and from there extend things to a much more general framework. So uh, the Hadamard product of two matrices is just their entry-wise product. Take every single entry, the ij entry, multiply it by the ij entry, the other matrix. And what I'm going to do is take, my end, take an endpoint uh, finite volume scheme I'm going to assume it's uh, periodic for now so that the first node is connected to the last one. Uh, and I'm going to rewrite it using Hadamard products. So I can think of this as basically being the difference between fluxes, where these fluxes, whoops, sorry, are going to be evaluations of this entropy conservative flux at two different solution states. So you can see that you have difference between the first flux, uh, the first and second flux, uh, the first and end flux, the second and third flux, the second and first flux, so on and so on. So if I write this in Hadamard product form, what I can do is I can uh, combine all of these fluxes into one giant flux matrix, where this just involves the evaluation of fluxes between every single solution state in the boundary, and take the Hadamard product of that with a matrix which essentially samples and scales all these individual flux contributions. For a periodic scheme, it looks like this matrix, which you might find a little bit familiar if you work with different step methods. 
So if I go a step further, I can call this matrix two times Q. I can call this flux matrix F. And I can rewrite the right-hand side of this entropy conservative finite volume scheme as simply the Hadamard product of Q times F multiplied by the vector of ones. So this is just going to be uh, essentially summing up over the columns of this Hadamard product. So this is a kind of cute representation, but why exactly is it useful? Well, it turns out that writing it in this way, it's a little bit more generalizable. We can take our entropy conservative finite volume scheme. I'll treat the entropy stable, the uh, sort of entropy dissipative case later, but we can write it in this semi-discrete form. And if I define M to be basically the scaled version of the identity matrix involving the, the mesh size, then I can look at M inverse times Q and see that that's actually a second order differentiation matrix for a periodic domain. And the key observation, which I will use in this talk, is that uh, I can actually show any uh, method of this form is entropy conservative so long as Q is either is both skew symmetric and conservative in order, in other words, Q times this vector of all ones is equal to zero. So we'll use this to extend to high order DG methods and eventually to reduced order modeling. But first I wanna mention, so this is for periodic domains. If you actually want to treat boundary conditions, it turns out that this is not too difficult. You simply have to replace skew symmetry with what's called a summation by parts property in a finite difference world. So we'll impose boundary conditions in the usual way by choosing appropriate ghost values. And uh, the ghost values will be multiplied by some boundary matrix, which scales your contributions at the left and right end of the domain. And our relevant uh, Q matrix in this case will then uh, be this matrix, which looks like a center difference, except for the first and last rows, which are first order differences. So this Q matrix satisfies what's called a summation by parts property. It's related to this boundary matrix in the following way to basically mimic integration by parts. And if you do that, then you can show that you are still entropy conservative or entropy stable uh, when you add dissipation. Okay, so the main innovation behind this, just to give you a sense for uh, some of the challenges later on, is that we can reproduce this chain rule based entropy identity where we take this volume integral and turn it into essentially an entropy flux through the boundaries. We can reproduce this fully at the algebraic and discrete level. Uh, and the key step in this is utilizing this entropy conservative property of this flux. So if I take the skew symmetric form of this contribution up here, uh, then I can expand it out and see that it's actually going to be the entries of this Q matrix multiplied by, oops, sorry, exactly this jump in the entry variables multiplied by this uh, entropy conservative uh, flux. And that we can, sorry, that we can reduce down to this quantity involving entropy potentials, and the proof is relatively straightforward there. Okay, so the first generalization that uh, other folks uh, figured out earlier on was that you can extend this to high order summation by parts schemes pretty trivially. So let's say you take a nodal uh, discretization, a spectral type discretization, where your uh, nodal points are placed at gauss lobato points. Well, if you define a nodal differentiation matrix using Lagrange polynomials, then you can show that, well, this has zero row sum, so D times one is equal to zero, it's conservative. And also, if you multiply this matrix by the lumped mass matrix for gauss lobato points, then you also get the summation by parts property. So this allows you to construct entropy conservative schemes in 1D. You can extend to higher dimensions using a tensor product construction. And this has largely been the workhorse of uh, most of the practitioners who uh, use entropy stable methods nowadays. Uh, we can also extend to multiple elements, not just a spectral element, but multi uh, high order DG um, by essentially adding an in, uh, using this entropy conservative flux as an interface flux uh, within our formulation. So we can now, using this, uh, use, combine the previous slide and this slide, uh, create the high order DG method, which is entropy conservative for arbitrarily high polynomial degrees. And if we add some pretty common interface dissipation like Lax Friedrichs, then it turns out we can show things are actually entropy stable as well. Okay, so this has been a long review, but I wanna to try to uh, set the stage for uh, essentially the work that I was, I've been in, uh, interested in looking at. And my main contribution has been looking at this one word, modal, to try and generalize these entropy stable schemes from nodal and from summation by parts finite difference type uh, schemes to more general modal DG formulations. And I should probably explain what I mean by modal. 
So if I use a nodal uh, DG formulation, well, I'm essentially assuming that I'm using a very specific set of nodes on a very specific basis. So, for example, uh, Gauss-Lobato nodes and a Lagrange basis collocated at those points. But for a modal formulation, I, it resembles much more the generality of finite elements, where you take any choice of basis functions, whether they be hierarchical, nodal, Bernstein, so on, so on, combine them with any set of quadratures, and end up with a reasonable scheme. So uh, before, uh, until recently, this wasn't, uh, it wasn't possible to actually do this while retaining entropy stability. So these modal schemes are interesting to me because I do a little bit of work on hybrid meshes, and uh, these modal schemes make it easy to automatically apply things not just to hexes, but to wedges, pyramids, and also tets. They were also interesting to me because I've done some work on underintegration, and uh, for nodal formulations, they often underintegrate a uh, solution and end up with fairly large discrepancies in terms of uh, uh, in terms of error. So you can see that this dotted line, you have an underintegrated solution. You lose more and more accuracy as you increase the polynomial degree. So I wanted to get rid of this. And more recently, after I saw uh, some talks from the audience, I actually got interested in trying to apply this to projection-based reduced order modeling as well. And that will be the second half of the talk. So I should probably explain why some of the what some of the challenges for modal formulations actually were. Our previous uh, the previous construction of uh, high order entropy conservative schemes relied really on the algebraic structure of these collocation type methods, and you can treat them as finite difference methods. You can basically treat things point wise. Um, when I'm thinking about modal formulations, you have to think in terms of functions, and that poses your first uh, challenge. That what we want to do is to take our formulation and multiply it by the entropy variables. However, uh, for high order DG formulations, this typically involves taking the test function to be equal to whatever you want to multiply the equation by. But entropy variables aren't polynomial, and our test functions have to be in uh, finite element methods. So there's a little bit of a hiccup here. It turns out that this is relatively easy to uh, to account for. Uh, in order to get, uh, in order to extract out the right, the relevant entropy balance quantities. So when we multiply our time derivative by the entropy variables, we want to get the average of uh, the average rate of change of entropy over each element, then we can simply multiply not by the entropy variables themselves, but by their L2 projection. The L2 projection preserves moments, and so therefore we can show that this uh, integral here is equal to the integral without projection, and that reduces down by the chain rule to what we have on the right-hand side. So this throws a little bit of a hiccup, though, in that because we're using the entropy, uh, projected entropy variables, we also have to now evaluate all of our fluxes using these projected entropy variables. So we'll take, we'll actually take these projected entropy variables, reevaluate the conservative variables in terms of them, and use that to evaluate our right hand side. If we don't do that, then we can't use this property of entropy uh, conservative fluxes, and our proof of entropy stability falls apart. So just to briefly illustrate it, uh, this is an example for a relatively coarse mesh. Uh, for the entropy variables for uh, the compressible Euler equations. I'm using degree four approximations, uh, eight elements, and if I take a discontinuous solution and I approximate it using a polynomial, then I get some uh, mismatch near a shock, but otherwise it looks fairly good. So if I transform these to entropy variables, then you can see that over these elements, this doesn't really look polynomial anymore. And so what we'll do is we'll project it to polynomials. So you can see that there's a little bit of discrepancy with this uh, red dotted line, those are the polynomial uh, projected entropy variables. And then when we map back to the conservative variables, we end up with the dotted red uh, solution in dotted red here. And you can see that there's some discrepancy, but it mainly lies in the vicinity of a shock where we don't really expect to resolve the solution very well anyways. Okay, so this entropy projection solves our first challenge, but there was an additional challenge which I'll try to describe in brief. Uh, so. For summation by parts type methods, uh, if we choose the nodes properly, then you have nodes which lie on the boundary of an element. And the design of interface fluxes for higher order DG methods, in short, uh, you design these interface fluxes so that they cancel out specific boundary terms in the discrete entropy balance. When you multiply your formulation of entropy variables, you end up with some terms that should all cancel out to zero in order to get entropy conservation. So because you have nodes on the boundary, you can use, uh, you can use the flux to directly cancel out those uh, uh, contributions from those boundary nodes 
And everything basically looks like a regular DG method and that coupling only happens through these boundary nodes. If you use a different set of nodes, if you use nodes that are contained only in the interior, it turns out that using old entropy conservative uh, technologies that you would actually have to have all to all coupling for these DG type fluxes. And that kind of ruins the communication pattern for these higher order DG methods. So I wanted to fix this and we essentially fix this using what we realized much later uh, was an old finite element technique of hybridization. So uh, technically speaking, what we do is we take our summation by parts matrix Q and we use it to construct an augmented block uh, summation by parts operator. So this can be used to approximate a derivative in the following fashion. You can basically multiply by, you can basically project this onto a Galerkin basis and then multiply by a mass matrix inverse. Uh, but we've introduced here this couple, this operator, which maps between uh, volume nodes and face nodes. So this allows you to basically uh, bridge the gap between your uh, nodes in the interior and nodes on the boundary of an element. It also turns out that it's actually a little bit more accurate as these uh, plots up here show. Uh, and you can also interpret this uh, type of matrix as adding a correction term, which kind of looks like the difference between the extrapolated flux and the flux at, and the nonlinear flux of the extrapolated solution. Okay, so long story short, once we have these two ingredients, constructing a modal DG method, uh, entropy stable DG method is actually fairly straightforward. What we can do is take our old uh, entropy conservative DG formulation and then simply replace this uh, first term and this last term with uh, the relevant new hybridized summation by parts operators. So once we do, uh, what's hiding behind the scenes is that this flux matrix now has to be evaluated using uh, these tilde variables, these entropy con projected conservative variables. And one other slight detail is that uh, I can get entropy conservation so long as I satisfy, uh, I can get entropy stability so long as I satisfy conservation and essentially a weakened version of the summation by parts property, which relates to quadrature accuracy. I won't go into too much detail here, but it's satisfied by pretty much uh, standard finite element type quadratures. Okay, so finally, some numerical experiments. Um, we tried this on higher order DG methods just to see if things worked back in the day. And we used essentially standard quadrature rules uh, from Xiao and Gambudis and standard uh, Gauss quadrature rules for all the face nodes. Plug this into the DG method and you get the following. You can run a Riemann problem with uh, shocks uh, without any artificial dissipation, filtering or slope limiting, and it remains stable with the only stabilization being applied, uh, basically coming from DG upwind type uh, fluxes. So since then, we've tried to move on to a, a lot more areas. We've uh, used this formulation to actually construct new collocation methods on quad and hex meshes. We've gotten some uh, new approaches for non-conforming meshes, which some of our collaborators in Germany are now picking up for their software. Uh, we've been working on extending this shallow water, to network and multi-dimensional domains, a coupling of say 1D and 2D domains. Uh, and most recently we've been uh, applying this to the compressible Navier-Stokes equation. So here's an example of flow over cylinder uh, at T equals 100 for a Reynolds number 10,000 and Mach 1.5. And just to have a little bit of a nice uh, break from me talking, let me share a quick video. Still getting used to, there we go. So here's a quick video of this actual simulation. You can see that uh, around the shocks, there are some oscillations. So we don't solve issues like Gibbs phenomena. Um, these are still present, but the solution remains stable despite the fact that you have these oscillations in your shocks. And this is run pretty much with a vanilla ES, uh, entropy stable DG method, uh, degree uh, three, no artificial viscosity, slope limiting or filtering. Okay. And go back to the great. So uh, what I want to do in the remaining time is really talk about how we extend this to reduced order modeling and talk about some of the challenges that we're still facing. Uh, with reduced order modeling, I essentially, one of the reasons I wanted to do a work on modal formulations was because they were amenable to reduced order models. You can interpret in a very, very naive way a reduced order model as basically being a, a high order DG method with very strange uh, modal bases on just one single element. 
And it was that naive approach that I first started with. So what we'll do is we'll take off for, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, we'll take a full order solution uh, and essentially try to decompose it into a set of modes. And these are computed using proper orthogonal decomposition or some other similar approach. Um, and the main idea is that we want to compute these modes in an offline phase where things can be really expensive, but have the online phase of a simulation, the actual simulation uh, for different parameter values be relatively fast. And the goal of this is to accelerate many query scenarios like uh, uh, like uncertainty quantification or design space exploration. So uh, reduced order models are useful in the elliptic and parabolic regimes, or they've been they have been well established for those areas because there they inherit the stability of the full order model. This is not entirely true for nonlinear hyperbolic problems. And this is kind of the issue I want to try to look at. So again, I'm going to start from a simple method, entropy stable finite volumes, same as before. And I'm going to just add a little bit of viscosity. So I'm going to um, basically just add a Laplacian type viscosity over the entire domain. Turns out that this is entropy stable. And, uh, and but I'm going to focus on uh, ensuring that when viscosity goes to zero, we end up with an entropy conservative type scheme. So, if I want to apply uh, reduced order modeling to this uh, to this discretization, then I can go through a pretty naive Galerkin, uh, POD Galerkin procedure as follows. If I have an offline approach to compute basis functions uh, from proper orthogonal decomposition given solution snapshots, then I can basically just uh, apply a standard Galerkin projection of this matrix system. So previously I had M times the UDT plus two times Q had more product F times one. I can simply uh, insert V, uh, multiply, uh, enforce that this residual is orthogonal to all basis functions. And uh, essentially if I plug in the entropy projection step uh, by introducing this pseudo inverse here, this projection onto the range of the basis functions, uh, then I end up with an entropy conservative or entropy stable ROM if I have uh, dissipation. So uh, one little note that's uh, non-standard here, because I am using uh, this set of bases, this set of modes to approximate both the entropy and the conservative variables, I'm going to construct my POD basis from snapshots of both the conservative and entropy variables combined. Okay, so I stopped here thinking that this would work. And when I talked to someone in reduced order model, they said, you're missing the whole point. I essentially have to also reduce costs for evaluating nonlinear terms. So the cost of evaluating nonlinear terms uh, scales with the number of grid points in the full order model, which is a major challenge. So if I want to evaluate the entropy projection, or if I want to evaluate this flux, then uh, the, si the cost of these, don't, they still scale with the original full order model. And what we want to do is try to reduce that. So we adopt a fairly standard approach, hyperreduction, where given a grid, we try to pick relative, uh, relevant sample points from that grid, either on the boundary or on the interior, in order to approximate nonlinear evaluations of this form with uh, this following form here. So what we're doing is we're taking a nonlinear function and evaluating it at uh, a bunch of grid points. And instead, we're going to approximate that with a nonlinear function evaluated only at a specific number of hyper-reduced grid points. So I is going to be this index set, which picks out certain rows of this basis uh, matrix, which course, um, each row of this basis matrix corresponds to a different point. We'll then weight these contributions and then multiply them by uh, this, uh, this sampled matrix transposed. So this is something like a quadrature approximation for a reduced order model. And you can see multiple examples, GAPI POD, DIME, empirical cubature, energy conserving, sampling and weighting. All of these uh, share a similar structure. We're going to focus on empirical cubature and ECSW in this talk though. So uh, the question becomes, well, how do we hyper-reduce the specific nonlinear terms in this entropy-stable formulation? We have Q Hadamard product with F, which is a non-standard way of writing uh, this convective term. And what we'll do is we'll try to hyper-reduce this by constructing a sample matrix Q sub S. So recall that if we can show that this uh, matrix is skew-symmetric for a periodic problem and conservative, then we get entropy stability or entropy conservation immediately. 
So the main challenge starting out was that most of the common options for trying to construct a sample matrix were either to subsample rows and columns of a full matrix, that sort of a dime-like approach, or to approximate uh, this uh, matrix Q to construct a sample matrix using a weighted sum of local matrices, which is an approach taken by Peter and Yano in uh, this paper down here. So the problem was that with both of these approaches, uh, your matrix QS, uh, your sample matrix loses either skew symmetry or conservation and therefore isn't meant to be stable anymore. So what we're going to do is take a different approach where we actually try to do a two-step hyperreduction. We first compress the matrix and then we project onto the compressed matrix. So our approach is as follows. We try to construct a modal differentiation matrix by uh, do a Galerkin projection using an ex expanded test basis. So think of these basis functions as essentially sampling the action of our original differentiation matrix Q. We obviously want to make sure that we differentiate our POD modes V properly, but we also want to differentiate one exactly in order to get conservation. It turns out for accuracy, we also want to make sure that we can uh, accurately sample Q times V. This is sort of an LSPG type approach if you're familiar with that. And then we'll just construct the modal matrix as V transpose times Q times V, where VT is this test basis. Okay, so now we have a way to express uh, the action of Q on coefficients in this test basis. All we need to do is find a way to transfer between hyperproduced points and these coefficients, which we can do using a quadrature-based projection operator P sub T. So essentially, we use hyperproduced points to project onto this test basis. And then if we chain them together by simply taking the modal matrix and multiplying on the left and right by the transpose of this projection matrix, then we get a sampled hyperreduced matrix, which is accurate, skew symmetric, and conservative, and thus gives us an entropy conservative reduced order model. So just briefly about this hyperreduction, we're constructing our hyperreduced points by targeting uh, functions which are used to construct a mass matrix. And as a technical point, because we're only looking at uh, targeting at uh, uh, using hyperreduction to accurately approximate mass matrices constructed from the POD basis, this expanded test basis might end up with a singular mass matrix. So what we'll do is we'll just add some stabilizing points, and I'll show you that these there's we don't add too many of these in practice. So these stabilizing points will essentially target uh, near null spaces of this uh, test mass matrix. Okay, so in summary, we have this two-step compress and project hyperreduction of this uh, Hadamard product nonlinear term. And then if we plug that in to our uh, formulation using hyperreduction, then we end up with, uh, with a, form a reduced order model, which is entropy conservative or entropy stable if you add an appropriate type of dissipation. So this is nice, but I should uh, make a little caveat. There's no free lunch. This entropy conservative method uh, reduced order model can actually be a little bit more expensive than a full order model under specific circumstances because we introduce more flux evaluations due to sparsity. I'll go into this a little bit later. Um, I'm going to skip this slide for time, but essentially we impose non-periodic boundary conditions in the same way that we did for DG methods using the summation by parts operators. And all this requires when adapting it to a uh, hyperreduction is to enforce a specific type of constraint in our hyperreduction procedure. So I do this using this linear programming approach of Pater and Yano uh, that is found in this paper. Okay, so let's show some numerical experiments. Uh, this is just the 1D Euler equation. I have a viscosity of uh, 2 times 10 to the negative 4. Uh, and I'm just going to run a problem which has reflective boundary conditions at the wall so I can show that I can work with non-periodic boundary conditions and develops a shock uh, after some time. So if I use only 25 modes and everything is incredibly under-resolved, and you can see huge oscillations, but nothing blows up. These are the uh, the values of the solution at hyperreduced points, and they look messy, but they don't explode. And in this case, with 25 modes, we add only three additional stabilizing points. If we increase the 75 modes, well, things start to look much better. We can resolve the solution prior to the shock really well, and when the shock hits, you can still see some oscillations in this area here, but again, it doesn't blow up. And we added more stabilizing points, but not uh, too many more. If we run with 125 modes, then things look like they're nicely converging, and we're adding only 36 stabilized points. And if we go up to 175 modes, uh, then the number of stabilizing points we have to add is only 28. So 
This approach seems to be working okay. We have a growing number of empirical cubature points that depend on the number of modes, but the number of stabilizing points seems to kind of taper off after some certain time. So one thing we want to test was robustness. Uh, if we were to run this with uh, this reduced order model with wrong parameters or uh, incorrect data, how does this perform? So we tried to emulate this by running the same shock problem, but completely removing viscosity altogether. So if you do that with 125 modes, usually this would blow up because if you don't have stabilizing viscosity, then the reduced order model can develop oscillations, which eventually explode. In this case, the oscillations are definitely present. They uh, reveal all sorts of ringing artifacts in the solution, but it doesn't blow up. It's garbage, but it is stable garbage is what I usually like to say. And we can moreover verify that the actual contribution to the entropy production is close to machine precision, uh, which is this right-hand side plot. Okay, so if we take a look at the evolution of entropy, then you can also see that as we increase the number of modes, the entropy, uh, the dotted red line converges to the, uh, the decay of entropy for the full order model quite nicely as well. Okay, I also wanted to check to make sure that this hyperreduction approach that we uh, were using, that it actually works. Uh, here we have an example of errors over, uh, this, over a certain time period with and without hyperreduction. So the line is without hyperreduction and the dots are with hyper, sorry, the line is with hyperreduction, the dots are without hyperreduction. And you can see that in both cases, the errors appear to be basically the same. So despite the fact that we're hyperreducing everything, we don't seem to have lost accuracy in our reduced order model. Okay, so just some examples in 2D. Here's a smooth Kelvin Helmholtz instability um, using 400,000 points for the uh, full order model, a viscosity of one over a thousand, 75 modes. And you get this. You can see that there's some differences in the reduced order model, like so there's some oscillations and striations inside here, but it remains stable. And we end up with a decent 1% relative error at time t equals three, which is 75 modes. And the uh, sampling points that we end up with, uh, we end up with 884 of them, and they're distributed kind of uniformly to the domain. So this was a good sanity check for us. Uh, we can also do the same thing with a uh, Gaussian pulse in 2D. Um, you have the full order model on the left, reduced order model on the right. Uh, and with 25 modes and the distribution of uh, hyper-reduced points that looks like this, we end up with entropy stability and uh, under 1% error. So these were sort of easy cases. Um, I was also interested in looking at an under-resolved Riemann problem where you develop a shock. And here you can clearly see that the reduced order model fails to capture the shock because, well, there's a shock. It becomes difficult. And uh, it's well known that reduced order models have perform poorly. So you can see a bunch of oscillations here and here that show up in the reduced order model with 50 modes. The relative error is higher, but despite the fact that these oscillations are there, they don't blow the solution up. So we're trying to address, there are two issues that I think uh, are pretty, uh, are difficult for these problems, which is both accuracy and stability. We haven't yet figured out how to address accuracy. There are techniques that uh, Young Su and others have proposed which might be useful. Um, we're trying to address stability and incorporate these techniques for accuracy in later. Okay, so this is all the good stuff. Uh, I should, pro oh, and the distribution of points you can see clusters pretty much where there's activity in this Riemann problem. I wanna talk a little bit about some of the uh, downsides of this formulation as well. So with since you have entropy conservation for a very general set of reduced order models, there has to be some sort of downside as well. And it turns out to show up in two areas, both in terms of the singular value decay and in terms of computational cost. So first, if we look at the decay of singular values, uh, the red is, uh, I'm plotting two sets of singular values here with and without entropy variable enrichment. So if I don't add entropy variables to my snapshot, then I get a singular value uh, decay that looks like this blue line here. But you can see that both the red line and blue line are pretty close up until about um, 400 modes. And that's far more than we need to resolve most of our solutions. For the Gaussian pulse, you can see that it's a little bit, uh, it starts to differ closer to around 50 modes, but remember that we were able to get under 1% error with only 25 modes for this Gaussian pulse. For the Riemann problem, however, it's a little bit of a different story. We use 50 modes, and if we zoom in on this picture, we can see that at 50 modes, there's already a little bit of a gap between the uh, decay of the singular values with and without entry variable enrichment. So we are paying a little bit of a cost to better resolve the entropy variables in this formulation. The more pressing problem for us 
is that for at least explicit time stepping, it turns out that the reduced order models that I ran were more expensive than all the full order models. And this is for a simple reason. When we're computing, the main cost for explicit time stepping is the evaluation of this nonlinear term, this Hadamard product between Q and F, which you can write down uh, entry-wise as a sum of uh, a weighted sum of these fluxes. So in order to save time, we usually compute this on the fly. And if we know that Q is sparse, if we know that certain entries of Q are zero, you can skip over those entries and avoid evaluating this flux for those entries. So for this full order model uh, matrix, it's incredibly sparse. And we actually only have about, uh, uh, I think in this case, we have only about 100 or 200 uh, flux evaluations that we have to do. If we were to compress uh, down this full order model matrix into a sample matrix using POD and hyperreduction, despite the fact that it's smaller, it now becomes fully dense. And so computing this Hadamard product can involve many, many more entries. So for explicit time stepping, I think this, this puts a little bit of a damper in terms of the problems that I, like, I can solve using explicit time stepping. And I just want to briefly mention at the end of my talk what we're doing to try to address this. So we're looking at shifting to implicit time stepping, where the solution of the linear system becomes a little bit more of a dominant bottleneck. And see, we we're interested in seeing how reduced order modeling can, uh, can be applied to this context. We found recently that it can be very efficient. It's, you can compute Jacobian matrices for entropy stable schemes in a very efficient way. And I'll just briefly mention that. So for implicit time stepping, we need Jacobian matrices in order to uh, solve a nonlinear equation at each iteration. And typically, these are computed using automatic differentiation. If you have a sparse finite element method, you can reduce the cost in this automatic differentiation by using graph coloring techniques. But these don't work very well for dense matrices. And AD becomes very expensive as the size of your nonlinear uh, term that you're trying to differentiate uh, increases. So what we found recently, uh, this is work with Christina Taylor, uh, is that if I have a Hadamard product uh, term in my entropy stable discretization, then the Jacobian matrix can be written in explicit form as basically uh, the Hadamard product between Q and the derivative of the flux with respect to the second argument plus a small diagonal correction. And what this does is it basically makes automatic differentiation efficient again because uh, this flux has order one inputs and outputs, and AD is very efficient when the size, the input and output are limited. So just to give you an example of uh, speed ups, if I have a 50 by 50 dense matrix Q and I'm computing this uh, Hadamard product uh, for the Burgers equation, then I can see that the cost drops from 300 milli uh, 400 milliseconds to about 3 milliseconds using this formulation. This is a comparison between directly automatically differentiating this nonlinear term and computing this uh, Jacobian using our uh, new formula. So we have this in a preprint and we've applied it to hybrid DG methods. I am hoping that Christina will work on this for her PhD and I hope to present these to you in hopefully a future talk. So with this, let me summarize our, let me just say, uh, I'm very grateful to the NSF for funding this, uh, this work. And if you're curious, I have a couple of references down here. So thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff, uh, for the wonderful talk. Um, I think I learned a lot um, personally, um, but we are going to have some Q&A session. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate um, to speak out. Um, I, I, I checked the chat, chat room. Um, I see that no, no question uh, was posted. Um, so uh, please speak out if you have any questions. Oh, don't forget to unmute yourself. Hi, I go. Oh. Hi, Mike. Yeah, this is Mike. Yeah, Mike was a. I got a question. I really did enjoy the talk. I thought it was great, actually. Um, Thank you. I do have a question. So you say you still get some of the Gibbs phenomenon, right? It's still stable, I understand, because you know you you you, you use the right. Uh, you can show that with the test functions. Um, but with the Gibbs phenomenon. If you have, is it possible that you can get like negative pressures that will screw up your equations of state? Yes, absolutely. And so I, I usually mention this in the talk, and I apologize if I've forgotten to. Uh, but yes, every so all the stability theory here depends on uh, positivity of thermodynamic variables. So uh, if those are negative, then all the stability goes out the window. Um, and we're currently working on different approaches to fix this. So. Uh, there are, you can, 
fix. So there are some existing positivity preserving limiters which aren't dissipative, which uh, you can apply at least to some discretizations. And we're working on trying to generalize this to a uh, basically some flux protected transport type methods, but essentially, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. This is an open problem. Awesome. Um, just add on to that, um, you know, that issue of the negativity uh, in the context of the reduced student model, um, there's a um, non-negative uh, the factorization you can use um, in order to you know, preserve the positivity, um, which can be issue more more of an issue in the global model context, right? Um, mm. This is of of the basis fun like non negativity of the basis functions of the right, POD right, modes, right? Right, and and forcing the coefficient in front of it to be uh, positive or non negative, then you are uh, you know preserving the non negativity there. Okay, and any other that makes questions? sense? Yeah, um, any other questions? Well, in DG, uh, yeah, you so you could use you could use like Bezier functions, right? And you're saying you're going to get rid of a lot of the instant phenomenon, which would make sense, but not all of it necessarily. Right? I guess maybe again, that's at the pressure. The gradients are still could be negative. Sorry, so can you say that last part again? Well, that 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 would smooth out, say, the displacement, but that wouldn't necessarily, or the plot, but not necessarily the gradients, so that you still could get negative pressures. It would seem like. The pressures. So, so I'm trying. I'm not sure where the uh, where the gradients show up. And I mean, so my my our strategy so far has been if we ensure positivity of say uh, uh, density and and temperature or density and internal energy, then we try to uh, recover positivity of uh, pressure by Jensen's inequality or some. This is uh, some some tricks that Q and Q introduced a while back. Um, I. Yeah, maybe, so I don't know about the gradient uh, issue that you're referring to. Can you? Okay, can never you, mind. I, yeah, I'll, I'll think about it. Tomorrow. Sure. Sure. I, and uh, and yeah, so we, we've explored Bezier in another life when I did weight propagation more. I actually uh, worked very, very heavily in uh, in Bernstein Bezier uh, polynomial representation. We have found that they work very well, but it takes very, very careful flux uh, corrective transport approaches, which I know that folks at the lab are uh, very invested in. And I've done a lot of work on. Um, so we we found that they that they could be used to preserve positivity, but that the coefficients were kind of a very they were uh, a sufficient measure, but a very rough, like an ac inaccurate sufficient measure at certain times. And I haven't found a way to get around that really. Thank you. Um... Any other uh, questions? I mean, it's, it's uh, today's talk was particularly on the high order uh, DG. So I, I think a lot of um, the folks from the MSM team uh, will have, um, you know, find it very, this talk interesting. Um, so, um, so, so Jesse, I have a very basic question. All right. Mm -hmm. um, you, so for a, at the beginning, for a continuous problem, you show that the average entropy decreases in time. And um, then you use that uh -huh. motivated numerical scheme where the average entropy is constant. And I kind of don't like that. So can you say something about that? Yeah, certainly. So, <laughs> right. So this is... Uh, um, this is essentially so this we only do it because we're assuming that we're going to add some sort of dissip entropy dissipation later on um but we want to try to ensure stability or at least this entropy conservation property in the absence of dissipation as well uh this is philosophically this i think is sort of a our stress test but in all of our simulations i mean we always add some interface dissipation for dg methods um or some physical dissipation for the compressible navigation mm -hmm. problems well, we do get that entropy inequality at the very end. Does that help answer a little bit of the question? It helps a little. I'm, I'm not sure I really like it still, but um, maybe I just need to think about it some more. No, that's, no, that's understandable. And, and so if I were, uh, I've had arguments with some other folks, uh, Jean-Luc Guermond and, uh, for example, where, uh, yeah, there is there are some issues I think that are associated with trying to target first entropy conservation 
and then adding entropy dissipation later on. So if you were to use a uh, a more standard lax Friedrichs type flux, then um, I think yeah, there are some, there are definitely some advantages. Um, I don't really have a the just the best justification I can give is that if you were to try to enforce entropy dissipation at the discrete level, then I think you would lose high order accuracy for these DG methods. So uh, the because we're out adding an extra dissipation, um, this Pattermark product formulation ends up giving you higher order accuracy. And then you add, try and add dissipation to make sure you don't lose a higher order accuracy at the very end. That I think is probably a better uh, defense of targeting entropy conservation first. Does that make a little more yeah, sense? Yeah, that, that helps, thanks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it, it's admittedly still an issue though. Um, we, there are some trade-offs. Thank you, Jess. Um, I think we are, uh, our, our you. time's up. And let's thank our speaker. Uh, thank you so much, Jess. Um, it was really great talk. I, I hope that, um, you know, you, you get to connect it with, uh, uh, a lot of folks in Lawrence Livermore, as I said before. And, you know, the, you know, the collaboration, um, is continued. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. So so much, everyone, to uh, for joining the today's seminar. Um, we have another seminar next week, um, so please stay tuned. And today's uh, the talk is recorded, so if you are interested, uh, please let me know. Um, okay, let's uh, let's add John here. Thank you, thank you again, uh, Professor Chan. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Jess. Um, um, I have a, I have a. Usually, I stay with uh, the speaker uh, after the seminar, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I have a like a follow up meeting right away, so I have to go. No worries. But, but I will catch up with you uh, later. Um, I, it, but it was really great talk. Um, and nice thank to you. see. Uh, you know, we, you applying the reducible model for entropy stable. Um, the Schemes. That's that's awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, but but did you the Shabel Fahad recently? Um, you know, is is it preprint or I, I think it's still preprint. Um, he published a paper about the is the talking about LSPG on a the yeah. stable. You know. Um, yeah, for under under resolved solutions, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I think you, you guys are talking about the similar theme um, with the deep run approach. Um, so I, I think you yeah, you might be interested in checking. Yeah. Oh, you already checked that out, I guess. Uh, I, I I saw it on archive, uh, and I saw him give a actually I think a virtual talk somewhere on on it recently. Um, oh, yeah, really? I, I I think we're both interested in, in the same approach. I. Um, I think LSPG by itself, it already adds a lot of, uh, dis a lot Stability. of uh, stabilization. Right. Yeah. Which, which for, I think for a lot of problems will solve things. I, I, my impression is that for, so, so I was talking with some other folks and, uh, one of the key differences I think is the tropical Galerkin formulation. You have LSPG and it's at the fully discrete level. Whereas this is a Galerkin, a regular Bubnov Galerkin formulation at the semi discrete level. So there's a little, you, you make some assumptions and some, uh, some you basically, uh, fix your type of reduce, uh, model reduction, uh, when you're using, uh, Farhat's type of, uh, approach. That said, it clearly will work very well, especially for under resolved turbulence. I don't know if I saw any shock problems in that paper mm. that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm less clear about. Yeah, I mean, it'll, 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 it'll be, um, it'll be difficult to, to capture the shock, uh, the shock. Uh, it's very shock Agreed. gradient. Um, well, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry I cannot, uh, stay longer, but, uh, thank you That's so okay. much. And I will, um, let, let's stay in, uh, touch. I'll shoot you another email soon. I, I finished reading your recent paper and I'd love to talk to you about it offline sometime. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Take care. See you.